Hi, it's Candace with Grow Local again, and I know it's been a horrible kind of year with all sorts of weird things going on, but we're not getting a break yet. Powdery mildew is coming back, and so is downy mildew. Now, these are two things that hit your garden, and they they go onto a lot of different plants. Squash is usually the one that you notice the most on, and it covers the leaves. The powdery mildew looks like your plant leaves have been kind of dusted with flour, and downy mildew actually looks more like a fuzzy gray or purple mold on your plant leaves. I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, you guys. I just know I got white stuff on my leaves and I don't like it there. Um, the easiest thing to do is make sure that your plants have lots and lots of good airflow. I've always just gone in and I just whack off the leaves that have got it. You put it in the garbage. Don't put it in your compost, okay? Because at the end of the season, you're going to need to do some good housekeeping because the spores stay on the ground. It a lot of times gets on your plants because you're watering on the bottom and it splashes up onto the leaves. Um, like I said, Sometimes it looks really thick. Sometimes it's just kind of blotchy. Your leaves will crisp up, they turn brown and they die. If it's at the beginning of the season and your squashes are just ripening, you're probably not gonna get a really good crop. But if you're towards the end of the season and they're already fairly well established, it's not really gonna impact them a whole lot. With your powdery mildew, there are a couple of home remedies that you can do. One is one half tablespoon of vinegar in four cups of water and you spray it on the tops of the leaves and you spray it on the bottoms of the leaves. Or you can use one part milk to four parts water and it doesn't matter what kind of milk. And for the downy mildew, they'll tell you to use one teaspoon of baking soda in a quart of water. Because I don't know what these are, I am going to try with the, I'm going to try it with the vinegar water. So like I said, when I go to spray these on my plant, it's just a case of misting it on top, misting it on the bottom. The powdery mildew likes the temperatures when it's between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius and kind of dry out, which is a little bit frustrating. The vinegar and the water um, apparently create a, an environment that they don't like. They don't like the wet and the vinegar changes the pH which also kills the spores. The milk, I don't know any background on it and same with the baking soda. I think it just changes the pH that the spores don't like. But that's all you do and I figure if you're just doing a half a tablespoon to four cups of water of vinegar or if you're doing the one part milk to four parts water or even the teaspoon of baking soda to a quart of water, it's not gonna break the bank. Try it, see which one works for you. It's not bad for the environment, um, and that's the biggest thing for me. Like I said, I usually just whack and chop and try to get some more airflow going. Um, and I do have an awful lot of leaves that are in the bag, and I'm probably gonna take some more out. But for now, that's all I can tell you is Nip it in the bud if you can, and if you can't, don't sweat it. There's next year. Hey, you guys, I talked last week about doing a straw bale garden, and I had my straw bale pulled out this way, which kind of hid this. This is me starting a lasagna bed. I'm always eager for more planting space, and this allows me to use a lot of my composted greens. It's the same concept as when you're just when you're composting. I started off with a piece of cardboard in the bottom, wet it down, then I added some manure and I did my grass clippings, I've done my veggies, I've got carrot tops, and I just keep layering the browns and the greens. Really good to start at this time of year because you're starting to get a lot of waste materials out of your garden that you can recycle. You build it so that it's about 18 inches high. This was about that high, and this is how far down it's gone in the last, say, two months. I have all my leftover bean vines in there. I've got some 
chicken manure, I've got straw, I've got all sorts of things in there. And come the spring, I'm going to add probably four inches of good soil on the top and then I can plant. If you are super eager, a lot of people will just plant right away. There's nothing saying that you can't do it. Just make your soil level deeper because by the time the roots get down there, the heat from the composting is not going to be too strong for it. It'll just add a little bit of warmth. Um, side, side note, the French used to do this. They had so much manure and straw and deciduous leaves. In the winter, they would dig a pit that would be about three feet deep. And it would always be about 18 inches larger than the glass house that they were going to put on top of it. And they would turn that the leaves and the manure and they would turn it about four times just to make sure that it was really really well mixed then they'd fill that pit with it and they would add about eight inches of topsoil to it and then they would put on trays or seedlings and transplants on top of that and cover it with the glass house the composted manure in there would create enough heat that these guys had market gardens in the middle of the winter and it was absolutely wonderful um, they found that if they just did the straw and manure um, that they got less heat but it lasted longer. So with the leaves and manure they got about eight weeks worth of heat and with the straw it just went a little bit longer. Um, when they were finished with it in the spring they simply dug out those pits of all that lovely compost and threw it in the fields where they did other kinds of vegetable gardening. So I thought that was just a, kind of a neat little side note and that's what you can do in your garden too. Hi, it's Candace from Grow Local and I just thought I'd show you just a couple of books here. We talked about pumpkins with the kids and there is an absolutely brilliant book called The Story of the Pumpkin Circle. It's the story of a garden, it's the pumpkin circle. And it has, for younger kids, it has some absolutely wonderful pictures in it. It's a very easy read, it's very informative. Um, you just won't get tired of it and it shows you some things to do. And I have found kids really enjoy this book. That's one of the ones that they'll go back to and they'll thumb through it over and over and over again, okay? There is another one if the kids are a little bit bigger and it's called Big City Bees. And it goes through where the bees live and where they find food and how these kids relate to them as they go through the city. There are grandpa gardens, there's a rooftop garden for a restaurant, there's a guy with bees. So it is, it's a little more reading, but it is good, it is interesting, and it shows you that you can garden all over the place. You don't need to have a huge backyard and you don't even need to live in the country. This is another book. She actually, this woman, her name is Sharon Lovejoy. She lives in California, so not everything is quite pertinent to where we are. Some of the insects and stuff might be confusing, but still, it's an educational. And she goes through these books really, really well. There's all sorts of things, how to grow a pumpkin garden, how to do the Three Sisters garden, growing potatoes in tubs. This one's on pod furniture. Um, there's your tub of spuds. getting ready and how to care for your garden. All sorts of short things, but really good to know, can take it with you for your life kind of um, information and projects. And it's really, it's one of my favorites. She's got two others that go more with the, uh, the stories and the projects that you can do with the kids. And for adults, or young adults, this is called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall. Kimmerer. I love her. It's like reading poetry. She is so brilliant. You just want to get your fingers in the soil and you understand how these things work together really, really well. It's indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teaching of plants. Um, when she talks, she paints pictures. You can, you can feel it. You just want to get outside and, and explore. Um, and if you can look at all the little paper clips I've got in here. Those are all things that I just keep going back to because I really, I found them interesting. I, they're tidbits that I love sharing with kids. So an easy read, but highly educational. And I think you'd really enjoy it. 
The other one I have is Elliot Coleman's new organic grower. This is probably more for people that are growing bigger gardens, um, slightly larger scale, but it worked for me and it's got all sorts of information in it that you'll find really, really helpful and viable and it's organic so you learn that the less expensive ways of doing things. I'm showing you this book because I used to have his The Four Season Harvest, which was my all-time favorite of his, but I lent it out and it hasn't returned yet. And it's been a couple years now, so I think I have to buy it again. But he is absolutely brilliant. He's very well known in his field. And he can get very, very technical. Some of you will like it. Some of you will skip those pages and just go to the ones that you want to see. Hi, it's Candace with Grow Local, and we're gonna talk a little bit about pests and attracting beneficial insects. The first one I'm gonna talk about are aphids, everybody's flavor favorite. I actually took a snip off of my rose bush and my kale. On the kale, you can see that there are some little gray fuzzy looking dudes. Those are your gray aphids. There's a couple of little brown ones too because aphids come in lots of colors. I know I found a plant out in my garden today with little black aphids on it also, but when I went to pick them, do you think I could remember where it was? So today I'm just going to show you the little gray ones and the little brown ones that were on my roses. Now these guys have little sucking mouth parts. So the easiest way to get rid of them is to simply use a good jet of water off your hose. As soon as you've knocked them down, if they were hanging on with those little sucking mouth parts, you've broken them. Those guys can't do any more damage even if they do crawl up on your, on your plants again. So they're easy peasy. Some people will use um, an ins a horticultural oil or horticultural soap. That works well too. Um, just be careful. I'm not going to say to use any home remedies. Some of them work brilliantly. Some of them not so much. The only thing I will say is be cautious if you are using dish soap, try it on a leaf first. If you're using a dishwashing liquid that has grease cutters in it, what you're going to do is you're going to damage the protective waxy coating that the leaves have on them and you're going to make them even more susceptible to insects and disease, okay? So that's kind of it for aphids. Squishing them off with your fingers, great job for the kids. I can do it on the first two plants and then I just grosses me out. So that's why I use the hose and just jet him off. And he's gone. The next one are slugs. And are they ever rampant this year? We've, I've talked to people who had 100 heads of lettuce and they got six that came up. They no more came up, but those lovely little slugs came through with their little voracious appetites and just mowed them all down to ground level. The favorite one, is beer. If you've got a container and beer, give your slugs a party. It works really well. You only need about an inch of beer in the bottom of the in the bottom of the container, but then sink the container so that it's about an it sits in the ground with only maybe an inch of it above the soil level. Some people sink it in so it's right level with the ground, but you might find the occasional beetle that climbs in there and drowns. And Beetles eat lots of pests. You don't really necessarily want to get rid of those guys. So that's it. Oh, the other thing is try to make sure that your containers have a straight side. If they are nicely sloped, it's too easy for the slugs to crawl out. You want them to get in there, go straight down, and not be able to come back up. And you'll also find some slugs just come for a visit, have a drink, and then go. There are other things that you can use. I almost forgot. Um, there's bait and you can sprinkle that around. There's a couple of different ways. You can put it just around your plants that you have concerns with. You can broadcast it so it's just willy nilly and hope that the slugs are attracted to the scent and they go there. The other thing is put it outside of your garden area too so that you're not attracting the slugs just into where your plants are. Some people have a lot of success with putting um, wood ash in circles around the plants that they are concerned about. And some people will use the infamous diatomaceous earth. Fossilized little insect skeletons. It's super, super sharp. Whenever those um, slugs go crawling across it, they are gonna 
get sliced up. Their exoskeleton gets diced up and they dehydrate and they'll die. The only reason I don't care for this stuff a whole lot is if it gets wet, it gets soft and you have to reapply it. And it's also indiscriminate. It can't tell the difference between earthworms, slugs, ladybugs, your ants, anything that goes across it is gonna get cut up and die. So you might be killing your beneficials too. Another thing that you might wanna try is your copper. You can get copper tapes and apparently it's because when slugs go across it, they get a little bit of a, an electrical shock and they don't like it, so they'll turn around and they leave. I like this stuff if you're the artsy fartsy kind because you can use your, um, you can just do it freehand or you can get stencils. And if you've got a ballpoint pen, you can make designs. So you can pretty up your pots and have your, your copper tape going around it or your copper mesh. This is like a tube, so you can split it up, you can bunch it around your stems, you can put it over the, the lip. The only thing that you have to remember if you're using copper tape is make sure you don't have any slugs in that pot already or that there aren't any plants hanging over your bed or your area where you want to keep the slugs out of because they will climb and they will drop in and they'll just think it's a free-for-all. Nobody else can come in and share because you made it a private buffet for them. And I don't think I have any other tips and hints other than that can be your kids pick them up and drop them in a bucket of soapy water. Or if you got the kids, you can get a long board. You can put it down where you've got slugs and just prop it up with a rock or a stick so that there's a little damp area and they'll crawl under there to hide. And then you just pick the board up in the morning and take them all off and throw them in your bucket of soapy water. Some people have good success with if you've had a grapefruit or half of an orange in the morning, you just put the rind down and again, prop it up just a little bit. They're attracted to the scent. And in the morning, you just pick it up, throw the whole thing in the garbage or drop it in a bucket of soapy water and use it again. And there, that's all I think I've got on slug prevention. Next one coming up, the infamous caterpillars. Now I, had the cat I had that lovely cabbage moth come or cabbage butterfly come and visit my place and I tried my darndest to save this guy and you know what he pupated on me can you see him next stage is gonna <laughs> be like a little cocoon and he's gonna come out as another one of those little lovely butterflies And easiest way of getting rid of these guys, again, is to pick them off. As soon as you find them, they are masters of disguise. If you look at the color, they are really, really hard to find on your plant. You are gonna see what they call their frass. It's that nasty looking, if, I'm squishing it. But if you look on your plant, on your broccoli, on your kale, on your Brussels sprouts, you'll see little piles of wet looking black goo. And that's them from chewing it up and pooping it back out. So you know then between that stuff on your plant and the holes that you're getting in your leaves that you need to look really well. They will, if it's a curled leaf, they'll hide underneath. They love when they're the same color as your stock, the rib, they'll hide on there. There is a product that you can use, it's organic, it's called BTK, and this is a living bacteria. This is a concentrate, you mix it up with water in a jug and you spray it. Now this is wonderful because it only works on caterpillars, it doesn't hurt anything else. And the caterpillar actually has to ingest that bacteria and then it will kill it from the inside out in about two to five days. So that's another one that you can use. Other than that, Pick them and turf them. They're ones I don't really mind squishing. One other thing I can talk about is carrot rust fly. Don't have any samples on that, but it's a little maggoty thing that goes through and leaves tunnels in your carrots. One of the ways that you can combat that is to get what is called a floating row cover or reme. It's a light white cloth when you 
plant your seeds, you put the row cover already, just float it on top, hold down the sides with soil or with rocks or with landscape pins so that it doesn't blow away in the breeze. And as the carrots grow, they actually just push up the cloth because it's that light and your, um, the carrot rust fly can't get in there to lay its eggs. One of the other things, if you're on a second floor balcony, just grow your carrots, put them in a container. Those flies can't fly that high and you won't ever have a problem with it. Now, what can we talk about next? Flea beetles, my favorite. Don't usually have a whole lot of trouble with flea beetles in my vegetable garden, but last year I did have, I'm not even sure what it was that was growing up in the garden and it was absolutely covered in flea beetles. They didn't bother anything else. So I left them alone when it was just totally covered in flea beetles. I picked it up, I put it in the garbage, closed the bag, I was done with that one. Um, otherwise, I would probably use the diatomaceous earth on it, but just sprinkle it on the plant that has the flea beetle or sprinkle it on the plants that are around your sacrificial plant and it should work. Um, other than that, research guys, that's all I know. And I didn't mention ants and I didn't mention sow bugs. Now, everybody thinks that those two are horrible in your garden and they're not. Some years we get lots and lots and lots of them and other years we don't. These guys come in a lot of different colors. They come in, some of them are black, some of them are brown. Some will roll up in a ball and then we call them roly polies. <laughs> I looked it up, they've got like over 27 different names that these guys are called. Um, they're actually, you guys, related to crustaceans. Their closest relative is probably the lobster. And if you want to get rid of them where it's possible and not always probable out here, they need moisture to breathe. They have um, specialized gills on these, on these plates on their abdomen and that's how they breathe. So if you want to get rid of them, dry the area out. They usually just go after dead and decaying matter. So they make an, a wonderful addition to improving your soil. It's just if there's not enough food or if there are really super small, tiny, tender shoots, then they will eat that. That's about the only time they're gonna be a pest. Once your plants get um, larger than a pencil lead, it's usually too big for them and they'll leave them alone. So I don't really mind them. And ants, those guys, they're voracious predators and they're voracious carnivores and they take, they take really good care of your soil. They aerate it, they take in dead plant material and get it underground to decompose. They're the ones that eat all those dead bugs that would pile up all over your garden. If you see them and they're all over your plants, chances are you've got the aphid problem because they will, they kind of protect those aphids like we do cattle. They get a nectar from them and they take that back to the nest to feed the young. And they will, they will actually attack other insects that are going after the aphids. So that's when it's an issue. But if you hose those aphids off, your ant problem's gonna disappear. I did not mention deer. They are a big pest in the garden. And there are all sorts of remedies that might work, might not work. They're one of those, really, I have no idea what to do. They can jump incredibly high, um, but there are a few things that I have heard and talk to your neighbors because some work better in some areas than others. Um, and you'll find out what has success in your neighborhood. For me, in the spring, when they are just starting to do their foraging routes, I have been taught to put fishing line up at knee high and hip high, 18 inches, 36 inches. When they come through in the morning, it's so dawn, it's that twilighty kind of a color, and they can't see the fishing line. They bump into it, they feel it, they have no idea how high it goes, so they usually just turn around and they walk away then hopefully that's gonna stop them from thinking that my area is a good place to be. Um, I do, however, use utility netting and bamboo poles. I just put the poles in the ground and then I use twist ties or Velcro and attach the netting and it goes all the way around. Works out easy peasy. Today, I just pulled the pole out of the ground, set it aside. When we're done here, <laughs> pole goes back in its hole. And my other one comes across and I just Velcro them together. Um, other people will tie 
CDs or bars of soap, reflector tape to strings and stuff. Um, there's one called um, a scarecrow and it's actually a mechanical thing that sits in your ground and it's attached to your water supply and it's motion detected. Anytime a deer comes by, this thing goes just like your sprinkler and startles them and they leave. Um, it doesn't discriminate either, so if you forget about it, you're gonna get blasted if you walk too close to it and your dog's gonna get hosed, and maybe the cat in the neighborhood too, so that's something else to think about. But deer, um, they will eat anything and everything. They love to sample, especially when they're young. I have them, they come in, they'll take a chomp off of something. If they like it, they take more. If they don't, they spit it out. And I go, oh, I need to grow more of that <laughs> and less of that. So again, find out from your neighbors, find out from your friends what's worked. Try anything and everything until you come up with something that's viable in your neighborhood or your garden. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about attracting beneficial insects. Adult insects need nectar or pollen to get the energy needed to lay eggs and they need plants to get it from. They like lots of herbs like fennel and dill and parsley, as well as flowers from the daisy family, like sunflowers, coreopsis, echinacea, cornflowers, or bachelor buttons. They lay eggs in the larvae that hatch, eat a lot of the bad bugs that are eating your plants. Aphids, mealybugs, spider mites, and scale are the most common pests that they'll go for. Ladybugs, they like plants like ajuga, marigolds, and dandelions. They also love to eat aphids, spider mites, and mealybugs. But the larvae that they produce look like little black alligators with orange markings. And those guys will eat probably twice as many as the adult ladybugs eat, or as the adult ladybugs eat. So if you see these little black alligator looking dudes with little racing stripes and orange up close to their front legs, those are actually your ladybug larvae. Okay, so leave them alone. They're, <laughs> they're gonna do wonders in your garden. Lace wings. Those are those little tiny pale green bugs with those delicate see-through wings. They like yarrow, dill, coriander, cosmos, prairie sunflowers, alyssum, and dandelions. If you were to catch and hold one, you'd find off, they, they kind of let off a little bit of a stink. Their larvae look like little green or brown alligators, and they eat aphids, scale insects, thrips, and other small caterpillars. These bugs have such big appetites. There's only one egg laid on a stalk so that when they hatch, they don't eat their siblings. Ha, <laughs> nasty, huh? Hoverflies. Now these guys are black and white or black and yellow and look like wasps, but they don't have stingers. They also have the unique ability to hover over a plant. Bee balm and daisy type flowers are what they like. Eggs are laid in aphid colonies and the little green gray larvae eat the aphids that most insects are too big to even reach. The larva can commonly be found underneath plant leaves where aphids are. So if you see a little maggoty guy, don't worry, it's a good thing. Parasitic wasps are also tiny and non-stinging wasps. The adults prefer members of the carrot and daisy families and they lay their eggs in or on the pests. The larvas absorb the nutrients through their skin and leave the dead bug behind. Look for them sitting on plant leaves, wiggling their antenna as they smell for food. Spiders, crab spiders like yellow, white, like yellow white nectar producing flowers like yarrow and goldenrod. Wolf spiders like places with debris to hide in. Jumping spiders like the sunny spots on trees and sidewalks or the side of my house. Orb weavers like their webs and they all like gardens that attract lots of insects to feed on. And ground beetles. Those guys like undisturbed soil and they eat slugs, caterpillars and other insects. So that's another reason why you should be planting at least a few flowers in your vegetable garden because you want to attract all these ladybugs, lacewings, hoverflies, and parasitic wasps, and spiders and ground beetles because then you don't have to use pesticides.